Welcome to the Modern Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert, Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. This is a really important episode because we're talking about a topic that has just been weighing heavy on my mind lately. And I'm so interested in this topic. And it's the topic of human perseverance. It's the topic of our ability to endure. Listen, we're exposed to so much today. We've got so much stress going on around us. And oftentimes when we think about stress, we think about it in the context of just maybe work-related stress. Like when you're like, are you stressed out? Yeah, I'm stressed with work. Maybe we talk about it in context of relationships. But what I like to point people to is this concept called your overall stress load. So this is pouring into your physiology all the different stressors that your body's experiencing, your mind is experiencing. So we do have that work-related stress. We do have relationship stress, but we also have emotional mental stressors that go outside of that paradigm. Maybe it's a struggle with, you know, something going on with something you're trying to accomplish, you know, some barrier you've come up against with your goals. We also have uh, workout stress, all right? So exercise stress, that's something that's in the category that we tend to think about, like, it's just good for us, right? Exercise is good for us. No, it's actually a stressor. It can be good for you. It's in this category of things called hormetic stressors. But the change, the real value comes in the recovery from the stress because the exercise itself breaks you down. It's catabolic. The rebuilding process is how you come back better. Your body doesn't like to feel like it can't handle that stimuli that it's exposed to so it comes back better. And I also give the example for people whenever I can of, you know, right now, if you and I were just standing there and we're like, we're going to do a workout, right? So we're at the, the door of the gym, standing there, we're about to do an incredible workout. We're just looking at the weights. We haven't even started yet. We're actually in better shape standing there looking at the weights than after we finish working out. We're in better shape before the workout. You're like, Sean, how does that even make sense? Because we tend to think of, I just did a great workout. I'm in better shape now. No, if we leave that gym, go get our blood work done, go get a hormone panel done, we could probably get diagnosed with some kind of an illness, all right? Core body temperature is going to be elevated. Cortisol is going to be nuts. Your blood sugar is going to be dysregulated. All kinds of stuff is going to be, all kinds of stuff is going to be going on, all right? Might not look too pretty, but all that we did was a great workout. We don't have insulin resistance, but it might look like that, all right? So keep that in mind. It's a, it's a stimuli for us to get better. It's a stressor that enables us to get better, but the recovery part is where the real magic happens, all right? So that goes into your overall stress load. We've got diet stress, right? Your diet can be a stressor, can go into your overall stress load in a big way, right? If you're eating like, you know, wild-caught salmon and broccoli or whatever, stuff like the MCT oil, like those kind of things we know that, you know, these these are more natural based foods, like things that have more of a reality, right? Something that's based in reality. If we've got like some some broccoli, some kale, right? Some some uh walnut butter, right? Those are more based in reality. Lucky charms are not based in reality, right? You taste the rainbow, you're gonna be tasting a big stressor. You understand? So all that's coming into play. So a lot of people are experiencing massive diet stress that their body is undertaking. All right, we also have spiritual stress, right? That goes into your overall stress level. So what does that mean? This is just basically this feeling tone, maybe that you're you're not really in alignment, right? You don't feel like you're on your purpose. You're not feeling like you are carrying a sense of significance that you matter. You're you're not you're feeling a little cut adrift and not really connected. You know, so we can all go through those phases as well. And that goes into that overall stress load. So identifying and talking about stress is not just one thing. And so our ability to endure these things, because we go through all of it, right? Whether it's in the context of running a race or whether it's in the context of living our life. And that's why I wanted to bring on somebody who's really become a master instructor in this subject matter and this incredible new book called Endure. And so we're gonna dive into that today. And also I want you to retain the perspective that this isn't just about performing well in endurance sports, all right? There's going to be a lot of examples that we're covering today that parallel with endurance-based sports, but this isn't just for that. This is in other types of training as well. And also, again, this is talking about endurance in our day-to-day lives as well. So I want you to keep that in mind because like, you know, of the nice majority of people as well, I have a little allergy towards running long races, all right? So like, 
once once it's like over a mile, I start having an allergic reaction and it's uh I start breaking out in unhappiness, basically, you know. So it's just not my cup of of tea. No, it's real talk. Sometimes, you know, you just feel like going for a long run and it is what it is. But generally, that's not what I do. So this isn't just about that. However, there are people right now listening, and also maybe this is something you're interested in, who are training for marathons, who are looking at ultra endurance uh, performance-based events, who are doing Ironmans, and who just want to be able to go longer and stronger, right? And so all of this is going to apply to that as well. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we dive into the information today and look at how we can apply this in the different areas of our lives and not just that one lane of endurance sports, because this applies to so much. And this information in and of itself is just really important for us to know as human beings walking around here on this planet with this fascinating body and mind that we all have, but we don't get the owner's manual, right? So we're going to kind of start to open that book up, take a peek inside and seeing what's going on in our internal regions, all right? So listen, and we can't have a conversation about boosting endurance without talking about cordyceps, all right? A study published in Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise tested 30 healthy athletes for six weeks to record the effects of cordyceps on their performance. The group that added cordyceps to their daily regimen had twice the oxygen intake of the control group. And oxygen is essential in supplying nutrients to your muscles and preventing fatigue and uh, preventing the buildup of lactate. All right, we're going to talk about that today as well. And another study done by the same group showed a 9%. So how does this translate, right? Okay, so what are the results? Showed a 9% increase in aerobic activity from taking cordyceps. Seriously. All right, this is come cordyceps, this isn't new. This has been around for literally thousands of years, thousands of years. And now today we just finally have the the modalities of testing to affirm what our ancestors already knew, which cordyceps is awesome for improving your stamina. And so what do we need to know about utilizing cordyceps? Should we just go Googling and go get random company X cordyceps and expect it to work for us? Absolutely not, all right? The cordyceps that you need to use, if cordyceps is the, is the primary thing that you're looking for, Four Sigmatic, all right? Four Sigmatic because they do a dual extraction. So do, they're doing a hot water extract and an alcohol extract to actually get the nutrients out of the mushroom, out of the cordyceps medicinal mushroom that you're actually looking for. You're not missing any of the, the sweet spots. You're not missing any of the bases. All of the bases is, are covered because many companies, they're just doing one extraction method. So we're leaving things out that you simply can't get out of the mushroom if you're not doing both. All right, so it's dual extracted. They have these really simple, easy to use instant packs. You literally just add it to hot water and you're good to go. All right, you don't have to open a bunch of capsules, that kind of thing. If you're trying to put in a smoothie or whatever, make a drink. Nope, these, and I've been utilizing Four Sigmatic. It's literally been like a couple of years now. And I, like every day I'm utilizing Four Sigmatic products. All right, so whether it's the, the mushroom coffee with chaga and cordyceps, yes, it does exist. Whether it's the chaga itself, whether it's cordyceps, whether it's reishi, lion's mane, so many great things to choose from. I've talked about many of them, but today I want you to keep your eyes on cordyceps, right? This is something that's clinically proven to boost your stamina, to boost your endurance. And there are very few things that are natural, that have been around for a long time that can help your body to do that without any weird side effects or weird crashes, all right? So pop over, check them out. Go to foursigmatic.com forward slash model. That's F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com forward slash model. Guess what? You get 15% off, all right? 15% off. Pop over there, check them out. I promise you're going to fall in love. All right, foursigmatic.com forward slash model. Now let's get to the iTunes review of the week. Another five-star review titled, I Appreciate You Immensely by Jake Morse. Dear Sean, my girlfriend and I are currently writing our five-star reviews of your podcast together. She introduced your show to me months ago, and I look forward to listening to it every week. Your story and optimistic approach to life are truly inspiring, and I love the holistic perspective you give to wellness. You are a great example of expertise and humility. I get so much value out of each and every one of your episodes. Thank you so much. That's so awesome. Thank you so much for leaving me that review. I appreciate you immensely. That's so cool. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody, thank you for heading over to iTunes and leaving a review for the show. Uh, it really, really does mean a lot. I, I just can't thank you enough. 
And if you've yet to do so, please pop over and leave a review. I truly, truly do appreciate that. And on that note, let's get to our special guest and our topic of the day. Our guest today is Alex Hutchinson, and he is a Toronto-based science journalist with Outside Magazine and the author of the New York Times bestseller, Endure, Mind, Body, and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance. Before becoming a journalist, he worked as a postdoctoral physicist for the National Security Agency and competed as a long-distance runner for the Canadian national team. And I'd like to welcome to the Model Health Show, Mr. Alex Hutchinson. How are you doing today, Alex? Good. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for having me, Sean. It's totally my pleasure. Very, very excited to talk to you. And as I told you before the show, I've had your book for a little while now, and I finally got to dive into it a few weeks ago. And it is one of the most fascinating books I've read in recent history. And having read hundreds and hundreds of books, that says a lot. This book is so well done, and it just really speaks to my man brain. I'm just excited to talk to you. Thanks so much. And it's, it's great to hear someone who agrees with my mom. That, that <laughs> <laughs> That's what's most important. That is the goal. All right. And speaking of which, I want to talk about your origin story. All right. I want to go back. So was baby Alex like super interested in, in running a long time? Or like where did this whole thing kind of get caught on fire? And of course, I want to talk about that 401 story. Uh, that you kept bumping up against as well. Yeah, so it, I, I am one of those kids who who was running around for ever since I was I was a you know a young kid. I joined my elementary school kids or school's cross country team when I was in grade three. And it's interesting we were we were chatting if, just before the the show started about kids. I've got a two year old and a four year old, and it, it is funny that I can uh, I can sit there in the kitchen and watch my kids doing laps <laughs> around the, the 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 ground floor. I mean, kids have energy, but. Definitely, you know, some different people have different uh, proclivities, and I, I always liked to run. In terms of where this book came from, like you said, I had I had a, a a kind of funny experience as a as a college runner. I was a 1500 meter runner, so a middle distance runner. 1500 is a little bit shorter than a mile, about 18 seconds shorter than a mile. And I had always wanted to break four minutes for the 1500, and I ran 402 in high school, right. and so I thought it was just a matter of time, uh, but. I got stuck for about four years. Uh, I was running 402, 401 uh, over and over and over again. So by the time I was a junior in college, I, I was my best time was 401. And after four years of running essentially the same time, I had concluded that I'd basically hit my my pretty close to my physical limits. I knew I could run under four. I knew I could run 359.9 on like the perfect day with a tailwind, with a good horoscope, with that you know, with everything <laughs> going right for me. Uh, but I figured there wasn't much more in the tank because I'd been spending four years. So I really had this sense of physical limits. And and what ended up happening is there's a tiny little meet in a town called Sherbrooke in, in Canada. And uh, this was in 1996. And I remember it very, very clearly. Uh, basically, what happened is I went through the first lap and the, 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 the timekeeper was calling out splits to let us know how fast we were going. And the splits he called out, he called out 27 seconds for the first 200 meters, which is about five seconds faster than I needed to go for what I wanted to do, which was break four minutes. And that's a lot at that, at that level. That's, that's a, you know, it's very, very fast. And so I had this split between part of my brain saying, oh my God, you are in big trouble, Alex. And, uh, another part of my brain saying, huh, it actually, you know, feels pretty good. And same thing happened. Second lap split was fast, but I felt remarkably good. And, and after that, I just kind of decided something's going on, Alex, you know, this is your day. Don't waste it. Put your head down and run you know, get to the finish line, take advantage of this day. And I ended up, that's what I did. And I ended up running 352, which was a nine wow. second personal best after this, you know, four years of, of just, you know, fractions of a second. And, uh, you know, after the race, I was debriefing with some friends who had timed the race for me so that I could record it in my training log and analyze it incessantly, uh, you know, obsessively. And, you know, there was a difference. It turned out that, that I thought we had gone out in 27 and my friend was like, no, it was 30, 31. And so the timekeeper, for reasons that I don't know, you know, either he started his watch three seconds late or, you know, there was a translation problem because this was in a French, French part of Canada. But he tricked me. He was he was calling out times that were three seconds faster than than I was really running. Uh, and and in tricking me, he, he, he sort of convinced me that I was having the day of my life. And as a result, I did. And, uh, the, you know, the real thing here is not just that I had a good day, but it's that that flicked the switch in my mind that stayed switched. I never again struggled to break four minutes. And in fact, in my next race, I ran 349. And in the race after that, I ran 344 and qualified for the Canadian Olympic trials. Mm. So it was this 
dramatic moment that it changed for me how I thought about limits and that, that I could never, I could never then cross the line in a race and tell myself, uh, oh, that's everything you had today, Alex. Cause I'd had this experience of thinking that I was at my physical limits and then discovering that there was a lot more. So I think that really, when I thought about, cause when I, you know, when I sat down to write a book about endurance and I had to ask myself, well, first of all, does anyone else care? And second of all, why do I care about this so much? And I, that's what led me back to that story. It's like, I think that's the moment with, where I really started to wonder uh, how are our limits defined? Yeah. Wow. I, get, I literally got the chills when you said that you qualified for the Canadian Olympic team. You know, I, I read the story, of course, but hearing you say it, it just is mind, it's mind boggling how you can make such a jump and then all of a sudden kind of live there and not just live there, but even uh, go on to surpass that, you know, in such a small amount of time. And then that eventually kind of led you into this area of looking at all of the pieces going on behind the scenes, because it is, there are quite a few pieces, you know, that lead up to stories like this, but there's also a big connection to uh, even the average person and how we live our lives and dealing with the ability to endure, whether it's something, uh, a mentally trying time or a physically trying time and how those meld together. So let's talk about that a little bit, actually. I'd love to talk about mental fatigue because it's one of the early things in the book that you cover and how your mental, being mentally fatigued can in fact influence how much physical effort you can endure. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, this, this was one of the things that surprised me. The, well, if, in half of the time it surprised me, but it was, it's like one of those things you know intuitively but then it's like, oh, you can actually kind of prove that. So it's like, if I put in a long day at work, a stressful day, let's say I'm on deadline writing stories, I, I know intuitively that if I go out and meet some friends to do a, a run or a workout, I'm going to maybe struggle a little bit with that workout. But it turns out that the, in the last few years, there's been some research showing that you can actually quantify this. You can have someone sit in front of a computer and spend 90 minutes doing a very simple task. Like, let's say you've got numbers and letters uh, flashing on your screen. And you have to just press a button, depending on what number or letter comes out. Like my four-year-old could do the task, but mm -hmm. it just takes some focus. After 90 minutes, then you get on the bike and you do a, an exercise test. What's really fascinating is that your perception of how hard you have to pedal is higher. It, your effort is higher right from the start. You get on that bike and you're like, man, this is five out of 10. Whereas if you haven't done that 90 minutes of mentally fatiguing task, you're thinking it's four out of 10. So, and as a result, you're able, if, if you're mentally fatigued, you reach exhaustion earlier, you have to give up sooner. So it's, it's not just a kind of gut feeling. It's this real physiological effect where your, your mind's state affects your body. And so I think this is a really underappreciated thing that if, if you want to reach peak performance, whether you're running a marathon or whether you're giving uh, a presentation at work or writing an exam, uh, we all understand that if you're running a marathon, you don't go out and do a whole bunch of training the week before the race. You you have to back off. You have to mm -hmm. taper your training. But I think we don't really appreciate the the importance of being mentally fresh for for a performance, for uh, allowing your mind to recover, giving yourself a break, so that when you're stepping into an exam, uh, you haven't been studying till two a.m. the night before, because that's you may learn some new facts. But your reaction times and your ability to to understand the question is going to be compromised because you're going to be mentally fatigued. So, uh, to me, that's a really you know it's a really fascinating area that this isn't just kind of like a gut feeling. This is really repeatable that mental fatigue compromises physical performance and mental performance. Yes, and you covered because one of the things that first jumps to mind when we're thinking about our ability our ability to endure and if we're doing you know, um, high intensity interval training or long runs is that it's our muscles that give out. It's our ability to process oxygen efficiently, those kind of things. And you talk about it, oh my goodness, in depth with, we're going to get to, and I can't wait to talk about it. But, um, this mental area is so huge and you go back and forth in the book talking about, because some researchers agree that this is, and they're very, very dogmatic about it. This is a physical issue with how much the human body can achieve. And so there's this other camp that is very adamant about this concept called the central governor theory. So let's talk about what, what, first of all, what is that? Yeah. So the central governor is this idea that was proposed by a South African scientist back in the, in the 1990s, a guy named Tim Noakes. And what he argued is that basically throughout the 20th century, scientists had spent all this time trying to understand the human limits, thinking of the, the human body like a machine. 
that right. if we can understand, it's like a car, you know, if you know how much gas is in the tank, if you know what the temperature of the radiator is and air pressure in the tires, you know if the car is going to be able to keep going. Uh, and, and we can think of the body in the same way, how much fuel is in the body, how, how effective is the, how efficient is the engine. And you can, you can learn a lot about human performance that way. But what, what Tim Noakes sort of argued, started arguing in the 1990s is that doesn't really explain. It's kind of like, it's like a car without a driver. You have to incorporate the brain into that. If in, in any race, what you also have to consider the brain and, and what he argued is like you were saying, uh, you you don't s slow down in a race because your heart is about to explode or you don't slow down because your legs are physically unable to to keep going and if you you know if if you release a marathon a, a lion uh, into the crowd at mile 20 of a marathon you're going to see a lot of people sprinting even though they're really mm, tired right. that their their muscles are still capable of going uh it's it's said it's our brain that decides we shouldn't go and so what Noakes said is we've kind of evolved to have a central governor uh, which is a not not a structure in the brain, but it's just a kind of uh, uh, a behavior that we we instinctively never let ourselves get to the limit. And you know, maybe back on the savanna fifty thousand years ago, it would have been a bad idea to just keep chasing the antelope until you keel over and you literally can't go anymore. So we get these stronger and stronger feelings saying, "I really need to stop." And so there's always some reserve being held. And so Noakes's argument, Noakes was the guy who really brought into the mainstream this idea that. We don't fail because our bodies fail. We fail because our brains are trying to protect us from failure. Interesting. That's really interesting. Um, one of the examples you gave, by the way, you went around the world. You were going to these different events, to different labs, and really seeing a lot of this stuff firsthand, which is really one of those things that shows up deeply in the, in the book itself. But there was a woman you talked about in the story who had a brain surgery, and she ended up uh, losing something really interesting and started to run much later in life. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, this is a woman named Diane Van Deren, a really fascinating story, uh, you know, also a little bit sad, but, but, but really instructive. She's a, she, she lives in Colorado. She's an ultra marathoner. Uh, and she is, you know, one of the world's greatest ultra marathoners, but she didn't start running or didn't start competing at least until after having brain surgery when she was 37. She had she had really serious epilepsy that was starting to really interfere with her life. Uh, and so she had a, a chunk of her brain about the size of a golf ball removed. And there's always collateral damage in, in, in that sort of brain surgery. You have a piece of brain removed, you're going you're gonna to lose some other faculties. And so she had some damage to her ability to keep track of time and distance. Um, and so you'd think this would be a disaster for a long distance runner, right? Like you don't know what your pace is. You don't know how far you've come. You don't know how, how far you can go. But it actually turns out that this is what made her into a great ultra marathoner. She discovered that she had this gift for ultra marathons after her surgery. She she uh, she started running 50 milers. Then she started running multi day races. Then it, you know a few years ago in her early 50s, she set a new record for this uh, trail across North Carolina. It was something like 22 days. Uh, she was running uh, you know all 21 22 hours a day for for more than three weeks. And the, that's the, crazy. The, the, the crazy thing was that, yeah, so she, it's not that she didn't hurt. I mean, the, these efforts were extremely painful for her, but most of us were constantly thinking, oh my God, how far have we come? How far do we still have to go? We have to make sure we have enough energy. She had a compromise. So her central governor, in a sense, her, her ability to monitor how far she'd come and how far she still had to go was compromised. At one point she said something like, look, I could be out running for two weeks. And if someone said, hey, we're going to do a run tomorrow, uh, a race starting tomorrow, I'd be like, hey, let's go. Because she doesn't ha she's not burdened by this knowledge or fear of what's in the past and what's in the future. She's just living in the present moment. Now, uh, n you know, no one chooses that, but it's sort of an example of why uh, you know, great performers often try and cultivate that ability to live in the present moment and not mm -hmm. to be kind of weighed down by what has what has already happened and what will happen. If you can live in that present moment, it's a it seems to be a way of kind of turning down the settings of that central governor. Wow. And when I said earlier that she lost something interesting, it was she lost that ability to track time and distance and it put her it gave her this strange advantage. And like you said, she still experienced pain, but because of not being able to to process accurately the time and distance is just it changes the ex overall experience that's crazy like that's a part of your brain that's making that happen and man that just it, it blows my mind you also talked about 
um, is it Marcora, right, in the book? Yes, and Samuel so Marcora. He, you, you mentioned him with several different studies, but one that was really, that jumped out at me was testing people's endurance when exposing them to those subliminal messages with basically those smiley faces or sad faces. You got to share that story. Yeah. So to me, this was maybe one of the most kind of amazing demonstrations of like, yeah, the brain matters. It's, and it's not just a placebo effect. So what, what, what happened in this study? He had cyclists doing a time to exhaustion test. So they have to pedal at a certain rate until they can't continue anymore. And on a screen in front of them, he was flashing pictures uh, of smiley faces or frowning faces. But they were only sh they only showed up for 16 milliseconds at a time, which is like 10 times shorter than a, than a blink. So the cyclist didn't, he didn't even know there were pictures showing up. They, they, and he checked this after the study. He's like, did you see anything, notice anything? No, no one knew anything was going on. Nonetheless, they were perceiving it unconsciously. And the, the cycle, when they were shown smiling faces, they actually managed to pedal for 12% longer than when they were showing frowning faces. And so first, there's a couple things about this. One is that okay, this isn't, you know, you can't explain this away of like, well, they expected to go faster. It was a placebo effect that, you know, they're suggestible. They didn't even know there was anything going on. So this, this is a clear example. And it didn't change anything about their lactate levels. It didn't change anything about their, their heart rate, their VO2 max. So it was just by manipulating what was going on in the brain that they changed. And so how does this happen? It's a good question. But, but the basic explanation, I think, is that, and, and what Samuel Mercora, the researcher would say is, this, you know, the smiling, seeing a smiling face evokes feelings of kind of ease or, or comfort compared to a frowning face. And so it uh, subtly alters how the brain is interpreting the signals from the rest of your body. So you haven't changed your lactate levels, you haven't changed your heart rate, but you've changed a little bit how your brain perceives the, the sort of seriousness of, of those signals. And so this is kind of a, a hint at some of the ways that we can then take charge of this and, and think about, okay, if, if smiling faces make a difference, what, what, what do the words that I'm saying to myself, what's my, what does my inter internal monologue do to the way my brain interprets the, the signals from the environment, from the rest of my body? Oh my goodness. You know what? This is, again, this is a clear indication that we cannot omit our minds from the equation when we're performing. Uh, so, but let's jump back and actually look at some of those physical attributes that you talk about in the book you you know of course talk about vo2 max but what i want you to start with first is this concept because you know this is what i was taught literally in a in a college classroom about lactic acid right that being the problem with you being able to perform so let's talk about that first yeah lactic acid has a long history i had a lot of fun kind of tracing because i'm like you I, I i grew up being taught that you know if i'm running hard that's the lactic acid in my muscles that's burning up the muscles you know you, you it's 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 slowing you down and it's just like sizzling in there you know it goes back to the early 1800s there's great stories of like some swedish a swedish scientist uh detecting lactic acid for the first time in hunted stags mm. uh and, and you know the, the harder they had run before death the more lactic acid they had the modern truth is it, it, first of all, we don't have lactic acid in our blood. We have lactate, which is an ion that's related to lactic acid. When you take it out of the blood and measure it, it turns into lactic acid. So that's why people thought there was lactic acid. In, but, but in your body, it's something called lactate. And it, it is true that when you exercise hard, particularly when you exercise anaerobically, when you're doing efforts that last between like one and 10 minutes, say, you, you'll have huge levels of lactate in your blood. It's a byproduct of exercising when you can't get enough oxygen to your muscles. So when you're going into sort of oxygen debt, uh, then you produce a lot of lactate. The mistake, though, is to think that because when you exercise hard, you produce a lot of lactate, it must be the lactate that's causing you to slow down. And so you can, the, the way you can answer that question or the way you can explore that question is, let's say, well, if lactate is the problem, what happens if I inject lactate into my thumb? Am I going to feel the same thing that I feel when I sprint 400 meters? And so if you inject lactate into someone's body, they don't feel the lactate burn. Mm -hmm. And and so you can say, well, maybe it's another another metabolite. Maybe it's the protons or maybe it's the ATP that occurs in your muscles during hard exercise. So you inject those into your into your thumb. And this is what some researchers at, at the University of Utah did a few years ago. Again, no sensation. But when they injected all three, when they injected lactate, protons, and ATP, 
which are all metabolites that are produced during hard exercise, when they injected those into, into the thumb of these volunteers, all of a sudden they felt like they were doing intense exercise in their thumb, even though they were just mm. sitting there. It's like, ah, you know, and the more they injected, the more it felt like they were, uh, you know, reaching exhaustion. So what that tells you is that none of those like lactate on its own isn't doing anything. So it's not physically changing anything in your muscles, but when all three of those are present, it's sending a signal to the brain. You have nerve signals that are sensitive to the presence of those particular metabolites. And so during hard exercise, when you get that signal, it tells your brain that you should feel. And so it sends a signal to your brain that you, your brain interprets as mm. fatigue and discomfort and that forces you to slow down. And the extra twist, not not to sort of go go too deep down the rabbit hole. The extra twist is you can block those signals. You can you can yeah. inject a block into your spine so that you don't feel those signals. You can be cycling on the bike, and you and you can you can still move your legs, but all the signals from your legs to your to your brain are blocked. And you think, well, man, what a dream come true! You should be able to just set world records like that because you're going to feel no pain. But what actually happens? is if you if you inject that spinal block the cyclists start really hard because they feel like a million bucks and then they start to fade and they crash and burn and they actually don't cycle any faster than they would without the spinal block so and what that tells us is that a little bit of pain is actually essential to performance to pacing yourself you have to be able to feel what's going on in your body if you can't feel the the, the discomfort then you can't pace yourself and you end up going too hard and reaching actual physical limits to the point where your muscles actually can't go so uh, to me, it's the, the message there is kind of redefining our relationship with discomfort, that it's it's yeah. an important source of information. You have to if you're pushing hard, you have to be you have to know you're pushing hard. You can't just n numb yourself so that you're unaware of your effort. Yeah, man, that's a powerful insight about life in general, you know, and being willing to experience the discomfort because it's a guidance system in a way, you know, and if we numb it, if we're ignoring it, it's going to end up hurting us in some aspect, you know, and seeing somebody run themselves to the ground because they're not paying attention to that feedback. You know, I, there's so many valuable lessons that parallel life in general in the book, uh, which is so cool. And by the way, when you start talking about the thumbs, uh, I started thinking about video game players <laughs> and what's the guy's name, Sam, the engineer here telling me about, and I just saw his pitch. I'm like, who is that? And I just started laughing. His name's Billy Mitchell, right? Billy Mitchell, Sam. So Billy Mitchell was this guy who was like a world champion video game player, right? But now there's all this information. And even back then, he's kind of been blacklisted because he cheated in Donkey Kong, all right? <laughs> he found some way to game the system. And I was like, are you serious? Because when I saw his picture, I thought he looked kind of comical, like uh, the guy Peter Dinklage, who plays the guy who cheated in the video game on this movie called Pixel by Adam Sandler, which is... Uh, if, when you watch it the second time, it's better. You know, it's one of those like, <laughs> maybe I need to give another chance, you know? But, and I used to be a huge fan of Adam Sandler movies. It's Sabado, Tali, ho, ho. But then it just kind of, you know, he kind of went downhill. But anyways, Pixel is really, really cool. And playing video games, something I was fascinated with growing up as well. Uh, but this translates to everywhere in our body, you know, where we have uh, receptors for pain. Uh, it's really, really interesting. By the way, I just want to throw this little fun fact out there. Our brain itself doesn't actually have any pain receptors. So when we think that we're having a headache, it's actually the the surrounding area, right? From your from your skull, right? It's not your brain itself. So shout out to the brain for not having pain receptors. All right, now I would love to talk about um, VO2 max, all right? So can you describe what that is and how that plays into uh, this concept of endurance. Yeah, VO2 max is kind of the holy grail for a lot of endurance athletes. Everyone wants to get their VO2 max higher and get their VO2 max tested. The The basic concept is this. VO2 max is the, the fastest rate that you can bring oxygen out of the air into your lungs, get it into your bloodstream, get it to your muscles, and use it to help fuel your aerobic metabolism, to help make your, your muscles go. So the, the, the faster you can bring oxygen uh, to your muscles, the, the quicker the pace you can sustain over a long period of time. And the problem is, um, and you know, as you, as you start pushing harder, your, your, your usage of oxygen goes up, 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 and then it hits a plateau. You reach a point where you, no matter how hard you work, you can't get oxygen to come any faster. The, the pipes just can't carry anymore. And that's your VO2 max, your maximum ability to carry oxygen. And it was discovered in the 1920s. Mm. And it kind of defined the 20th century of physiology because it felt like this seemed like a really kind of absolute uh, empirical 
uh, quantification of endurance. You could say, well, let's look at the, the VO2 max of, of, uh, of different people, and then we can tell you who's going to be a better athlete. Mm. And of course, very soon they realized, well, the other factors matter. Like VO2 max is like how quickly can you pump gas into the, into the engine, but you also need you also need to know how efficient the engine is. So that's in running. That's something called running economy. It tells you basically your, your gas mileage as a, as a runner. And th- there's, there's various other factors. So you can refine it. But VO2 max is kind of the center of this idea that if we understand how all the parts of the body move or how all the parts, parts of the, the machine fit together, we can, we can calculate what each person's ultimate limits are. And so there's been a backlash, I would say, in the last... 10, 15 years, accompanying this idea of the central governor, moving away from the idea that, oh, actually, you know, if you go to the Olympics and you test the VO2 max of everyone at the, in the Olympic marathon, you're not going to be able to tell who wins, which is definitely true. Um, so then the the backlash says, well, if VO2 max is useless, it doesn't tell us anything. And that's not true either, because VO2 max does tell us a lot. It just doesn't tell us everything. And so and this is one of those areas where, you know, as, as in so many areas of life, unfortunately, where debates tend to get kind of polarized or go swing from one extreme to the other. Like, it's all about VO2 max. No, VO2 max is useless. It's like, no, VO2 max is useful in context, but it doesn't tell you everything. It tells you something because the body sure is important. Like, my, no amount of mental strength is going to take me to the Olympics and make, you know, allow me to set a world record. You also have to have the VO2 max. But within a, so you have to kind of integrate the two. So VO2 max, yeah, it's, it was overvalued, then it was undervalued. And I, you know, I'm here to say it should be somewhere in the middle. Oh, perfect. Perfect. And so this is something that people can actually increase. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy to increase and it doesn't increase indefinitely. Um, but I mean, you can double it if, (laughs) if, if you go from being sedentary to, uh, to, uh, tra- training hard for a number of years, like an elite athlete might have an, a VO2 max, an elite endurance athlete might have a VO2 max in the 70s or 80s. There's a few people in the 90s, very, very few. Um, you got people in the 30s or 40s if they're just sedentary middle-aged adults um, and a, a fit adult, not an athlete, but just a fit athlete might be in the 50s. So there's a wide range. You've got people, you know, three times and and there's a lower threshold when you especially when you talk about older adults when you talk about people getting into their 60s 70s 80s uh, if you get below I don't I don't remember the exact threshold but you know roughly if you're getting into around 20 or 18 that's the point where you don't have enough aerobic power to get around your apartment and do do mm. things on your own you don't have the, the the ability to get to the door get to the fridge to bend over pick things up so vo2 max is is not just a, a, an important parameter for athletes it's an important parameter for for healthy independent living and it's so it's important to it's again it's not everything but it's it's a pretty uh, useful parameter to tell you where you're at in terms of your overall fitness wow man that just made me think about uh that movie wally Right? Isn't that the movie where the humans just stop moving around? He's like, Wally, Eva. man, that was crazy. Like, and it's just like one of those things that, wow, that can be a strange possibility, you know? Um, but there, the great news we have work like yours and what we're doing to really get the information out there and how important movement is, um, not just for the sake of the, you know, physical appearance, but literally just being able to do basic functions and live our lives with freedom. You know, it's kind of important. So, uh, wow, that's really, really great insight. I want to talk to you about the role that oxygen plays into all of this, but we're going to do that right after this quick break. So sit tight. We'll be right back. Today, we're in the midst of a new revolution with our understanding of food. We used to just be focused on this macronutrient paradigm, proteins, fats, carbohydrates, carbohydrates and proteins got a pretty good name, but fats were drug through the mud. Why is that? Because it's called fat. All right, the name implies something different than the other two. Because when we hear the word fat, we think about fat on our bodies. Fat in food and fat in our bodies are two totally different things. And it's like thinking, if I eat blueberries, I'm going to turn blue. When you think that eating fat is going to turn you fat. It just doesn't work like that. And any of those three macronutrients can actually put fat on your body if you eat too much or the wrong types. Healthy fats, which I'm proposing that we start to call lipids or even energy, are incredibly important for every single function in your body. Your cells, every single cell in your body, we have upwards of 100 trillion cells that make you up. 
require fats to just maintain the integrity of your cell membranes. We're talking about the thing that holds your cells together and enables your cells to communicate. It's very important. Also your brain. Your brain is mostly fat and water. This is why fats are so important. When you're deficient in fats, especially the right kinds of fats, you can see some big issues. So in order to address that, some of my favorite things today are MCT oils. And specifically, if we look at emulsified MCT oils that actually taste amazing. And these are medium chain triglyceride oils that are extracted from things like coconut or palm. And these medium chain triglycerides have a thermogenic effect on the body, which means they are able to positively alter your metabolism. All right, that's number one, thermogenic effect from MCT oils, positively altering your metabolism. Number two, MCTs are more easily absorbed by your cells. So unlike conventional food of any type that has to go through a pretty arduous process of digestion, turning that food stuff into you stuff, MCTs are able to go directly to your cells and provide almost instant energy. Number three, MCT oils are very protective of your microbiome. There's so much research today about the importance of having a healthy microbiome and the integrity of our gut. MCT oils are one of those things that help to support that because they're especially effective at combating viruses, parasites, bacteria, and there's so much goodness that is able to be found in these MCT oils, but you wanna get the good stuff. And for me, that's why I go to onit.com forward slash model. That's O-N-N-I-T.com forward slash M-O-D-E-L to get the emulsified MCT oils, which is like a coffee creamer. These are great to add to your coffees and teas, smoothies and things like that to get in a little bit of extra flavor plus all the benefits of MCT oils. They're easy to stir so you don't have to throw everything into a blender just to get a nice coffee drink, but also they taste good and they make the process of being healthy, fun and enjoyable. So head over, check them out. They've got vanilla, coconut, cinnamon swirl, and strawberry. It's one of my favorites. So go to onit.com forward slash model for 10% off your entire purchase, not just for the MCT oil, but all of the health and human performance supplements that Onit carries and all of their fitness equipment, gear, and so much other cool stuff. All right, head over there, check them out, onit.com forward slash model. Now back to the show. All right, we are back and we're talking with the author of the best selling book, New York Times bestseller. Endure, and it's Mr. Alex Hutchinson. And before the break, we were talking in, just kind of leading into this conversation about oxygen, right? This is our most important nutrient. We can survive for weeks without food, days without water, potentially, depending on the circumstances, which he talks about in the book, and only minutes without oxygen, all right? It's very, very vital. So, Alex, how does oxygen play into this whole equation with endurance? Yeah, it, this was really one of the most surprising and interesting things for me because as an endurance athlete, you know, as a runner, you think about oxygen all the time in the sense that you're, you know, you're panting, right? And you feel like oxygen is a, a limiting factor. So I, I, I really wanted to explore, okay, where does oxygen really become a, an absolute limit? You know, you, you're panting, but when, when are you actually running out of oxygen? So that led me to the, to, to free divers because they're, mm. they're the best breath holders in the world. They're the ones who can... Uh, you know, actually not just pant, but they can stop breathing for a long time. And can you share what free diving is really quickly? Yeah. Yeah. So free diving is basically another way to, to, to thing to call it would be breath hold diving. It's just you, uh, a, a string, string bikini or speedo and yeah, you, you, you dive under the water and you hold your breath and you, you can stay down there. And if you're me, you can stay down there for, you know, 10 to 15 seconds. But if you're a trained free diver, you can you can do amazing things. You can you can dive down all by yourself, no no tricks, no nothing. Uh, you know, three hundred. I think the record is it's one hundred and two meters, which is like three hundred and thirty five feet or something below the surface on a single breath, and then make it back. And you know, there's a lot of crazy things going on at that point. There's you know wild pressures. You have to be careful you don't collapse your lungs. But the key thing is you have to not breathe. And so. I mean, free diving is cool, but one of the things free divers do, it's kind of like the, the equivalent of the sort of home run derby in baseball where you say, let's just take one skill and see one aspect of this skill and see how far we can take it. So for them, that's, that's just breath holding. So forget, they, they say, forget about the diving part. Let's just sit in a swimming pool, put our face underwater and see who can hold their breath for the longest. And, you know, this is, this was the single most surprising thing for me that a human being can do that can hold their breath for 11 minutes and 35 seconds. 
Uh, and this is not like, you know, David Blaine did, uh, did, a uh, you know, 17 minutes, but he had, he was breathing pure oxygen before the, the, uh, the, the breath hold. That's a bit of a trick. You can do that, but this is with no trickery, just like waltz up, hold your breath 11 minutes. And so that, that, you know, that really forces you to, to reevaluate. Well, well, why, why is it that I can only hold, only hold my breath for, you know, 90 seconds? Mm -hmm. it's, and it's not because the the free divers are, they're not like, you know, nine feet tall with lungs the size of a swimming pool. They're just ordinary people. What they've learned to do is ignore the warning systems in their body the, the, and go right to their actual limits. So for most of us, we, if, you tr if I try and hold my breath, I will reach a point where my breathing muscles are literally contracting involuntarily. They're forcing me to breathe. But that's not because I'm out of oxygen. That's actually triggered by carbon dioxide levels in my blood that have risen to a certain point. And, but I can't resist it. So that, that, that's the end of my breath hold. Free divers have learned, they can't, they can't turn off that warning system, but they can, they've learned to, of, to, to not breathe even though their breathing muscles are, are contracting. And I had a chance uh, a few months ago actually to talk to a guy named Brandon Hendrickson who set the American record for breath holding last year. He held it for eight minutes and 35 seconds. And what he told me is he gets these involuntary breathing contractions. And during his, his record breath hold, that started at around four minutes, a little bit after four minutes, between four and five minutes. That's the point at which his carbon dioxide warning system was, was flashing. And he's able to just ignore that. He went all the way to eight minutes and 35 seconds. And that's the point at which he's actually out of oxygen. These guys can hold their breath. They've disabled the warning system. They can hold their breath until they actually lose consciousness, which is, of course, dangerous if you're... Uh, uh, if you're underwater, that's a factor of two between the warning system going off when your body thinks you're at a limit at four minutes. And then at eight minutes, that's when you actually hit the limit. So to me, wow. that's a real kind of a great illustration of the difference between a warning sign and a stop sign that there's, there's this huge safety margin that most of us, uh, aren't able to access. And even our environment itself is a player in when these warning systems are going off and how they are, because you talked about something called the mammalian dive reflex. So yeah, talk this, about that. This, this is amazing. Basically, I don't want to get too gruesome here, but there, there was a, a study back in the 1890s where they basically drowned ducks and to, to see how long they, or, you know, how, how long they could last. Suffer and uh, succotash. Yeah, this was not a study that anyone would do now. And I, 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 I don't actually, in all seriousness, I, I don't mean to joke about it, but they, they found that if you, if, you, if you basically strangled a duck in the open air versus underwater, the duck would last like eight minutes without air uh, out of the water and like 23 minutes underwater. So there was something about being in water that allowed the duck to last without oxygen for longer. Uh, and it turns out we're, we're the same. And in fact, all mammals have similar responses. You, if you put your, that, and that's why when they do these breath holding contests, they do them in a swimming pool, uh, not, not just to prevent cheating because, because it's, you know, you can't breathe when you're underwater, but also because when you put your face in water, a bunch of things happen. Your your heart um, heart rate immediately slows down, mm. and there's there's various other things. In fact, your spleen stores red blood cells, and after a while, it starts to squeeze extra red blood oxygen carrying red blood cells out into your circulation to give more oxygen to your to your heart and and brain. And so, one of the interesting things to me is that you you know the kind of cliche of uh, you know you're feeling kind of uh, panicked or something like that. You splash cold water on your face. In a sense, that may be triggering a, a, the, the mammalian dive reflex a little bit and slowing down your heart rate. So that's why, you know, put a, put some cold water on your face. It's going to calm you down because it's it's tapping into this deep, deep, deep evolutionary uh, response of when your face feels water, you know that you're going to need not need oxygen. So your body automatically starts to calm itself down. Mm. Wow. That. OK, so. This is just, again, one area. We're looking at oxygen. You cover so much in the book. And there's so many things I want to ask you about, but I definitely want to talk about muscles because this is just, you know, this is one of the things that we just tend to immediately think about in performance, especially when it has to do with sports. You shared a story of uh, a man who actually was a very descriptive story, essentially lifting a car off of a person which I thought was really fascinating in and of itself. Can you share that story and why you put it in the book? Yeah. And you know, this, in a sense, this was one story that's representative of so many stories that, that, uh, you know, it, it, you look around in the news and you'll find that at least once a year, there's a story of someone like their loved one is gets pinned under a, a car and they, and they save the loved one by lifting it off. In this case, it was a, a guy in Tucson, Arizona, uh, a, a teenager on a bike was pinned under a, a Camaro 
and he just went and and lifted the Camaro until someone else could pull the pull this kid out from under the car. And you're like, well, a Camaro weighs typically about three thousand pounds, and you know the the record for deadlifting is in the neighborhood of eleven hundred pounds, depending on how you uh, you know which record you're looking at. The, I think the highest one is actually from the 1983 uh, World Strong- Strongest Man competition. It was lifting 1,100 pounds of cheddar cheese with a kind of bendy uh, bendy bar. So whatever, it's in the neighborhood of 1,100 Got any pounds. Cheese? Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, that's, they had a lot of cheese in that in that in that competition. But uh, there's a big difference between 1,100 pounds and 3,000 pounds, and you can start to get rid of some of that difference. You can say, well, he didn't lift the whole car above his head; he lifted the front end of the car. So there's leverage, there's, you know, he's lifting half the car, depends where the wheels are, depends what the weight distribution of the car is, yada, yada, yada. You're still not going to get it down to 1100 pounds, or at least it's, it's, it's tough to. So the question is, is there such a thing as hysterical strength, which is this idea that, you know, when a mother sees her baby in, in distress, all of a sudden she's able to, you know, leap over tall buildings. Uh, and this debate has been around forever. Uh, and there's all these examples like this, the, the example that I gave it from Tucson in the book, uh, I included that because it had a bunch of eyewitnesses. Like there's people who saw what was going on and, and the guy who, who did the lift, it's like he later that evening, he's driving home and he suddenly notices he's, he broke like eight of his teeth while he was clenching his jaw. So, you know, clearly something crazy happened here. He was, you know, there's this fight or flight response, but how big it is, is it and how, you know, does it really exist? And so I, you know, I tried to, I tried to dig into the literature as much as I could, but of course you, you don't have lab experiments where you put babies under cars and see if people can live, lift them off. Like right. it's, you know, it just doesn't happen. But one of the ways they try and test it is using electric shocks. And so once people realized you could make muscles contract with electric shocks, they're like, well, let's see how strong, you know, let's, let's turn up the voltage and see how strong people get when we make, when we zap their muscles with electricity. And for a long time, that, that the conclusion was it's definitely true. Man, people are way strong. Like if I try and lift something versus if you use electricity to force me to contract my muscles, you can get a way stronger contraction. The problem is th- th- those tests were kind of misleading because it felt way stronger, but but that's just because it was painful. Um, and so finally in the 1950s, they started to be able to isolate like single muscles and say, well, let's check a maximum voluntary contraction versus uh, electrically stimulated one. And what they find is actually, uh, there's, that, that, as far as they can tell, there doesn't seem to be a lot of, uh, you know, hidden capacity that most people can recruit about 90, 93, 95% of their maximum strength. And so, the, and then, you know, not to, not to, again, disappear down the rabbit hole here, but there's, there's studies of Soviet weightlifters where they suggest that actually most people only recruit 60% of their available strength mm-hmm. and, you know, in, in competition, which is sort of like, you know, seeing your baby under a car, but not quite, you can access more of that, maybe up to 90%. Um, in the end, the answer, you know, I hate to say is, is sort of inconclusive, except to say that for a given muscle, uh, we can actually, it does appear that we can actually access a lot of, a uh, pretty high fraction of the strength that's available. But when you're talking about something like lifting a car, you're not just talking about one muscle. You're talking about like 17 muscles working in together. And right. when you talk about that sort of complex motion, when I talk the scientists I talked to, they said, well, that's, a, that's different. And it's much easier to believe that when you're trying to do something like that voluntarily, you can get, uh, under normal circumstances, you might be able to you might not really max out because you're getting all these muscles work, working together. And when you have this extreme moment of like nothing else matters other than lifting this car, you might be able to uh, squeeze out that extra 10 percent, 15 percent, something like that. Um, so I think that it's it's fair to say that like you're not going to double your strength in a in a moment of of panic, but but th- there there is probably some sort of. Uh, reserve that we can access uh, under under the craziest of circumstances. That's so fascinating. And so, again, this kind of concept of the central governor being able to, to keep us from maxing out, like there's always a little bit of space there and keeping that in mind. And even you talked about in the, in the book, uh, even in the heat of competition, like it can bring out another percentage, another jump in your percentile just from that alone. Uh, and versus just training with, you know, yourself or maybe with your coaches practice, that kind of thing. 
And so these are things that we kind of think about, we kind of know commonly, but we never really put down on paper like this. And that's why I really love this book. So let's talk about muscles in the context of, so this is, this is also like a very strong momentary situation where we have the example that we just talked about of lifting car up. What about in the context of running a really long way? What's going on there with the muscles? How are the muscles getting fed? How should they be fed? Let's talk about that. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a, it, if you thought the waters were muddy when I, uh, when I talked about trying to lift the car up, it, it, it gets really complicated when you say, what's holding you back if you're running like, you know, a hundred mile race through the mountains or something like that. There's some pretty amazing research that they can do now where they can, they can take people and you can test how much muscle strength they've lost by, uh, by using electricity to stimulate and to see how, how strong you can force their muscles to contract. You can also then take magnetic pulses to their brain to make their muscles contract. And then you can also, that, that allows you to see, well, how much of the fatigue that we're seeing is in the central nervous system rather than in the, in the muscles itself. And so you can kind of distinguish between the f central fatigue that's in the brain and peripheral fatigue that's in the muscles. And what's interesting is that they find once you get out past a per certain point in long efforts, the muscle fatigue actually doesn't get any worse. You, if you run 100 miles or if you run 200 miles, as far as your muscles concerned, at the end of those races, you, you, the level of muscle fatigue is pretty much the same. Because mm. at that point, muscle fatigue is not the issue. When it's really long, it, it's, it's the fatigue in the brain and the psychological battle that's the real, the, the real challenge. And so the, the longer the, the, the event gets, the, the more clearly it becomes that what matters isn't what your muscles can do. What matters is how much, how, how, how hard your brain is willing to push yourself. Uh, and, and, and so that, I think that, like you said before, I think this is some of the, one of those things that people have, have kind of sensed intuitively. If you talk to like ultra marathoners, they're like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a mental battle. It's all about being willing to suffer and learning to push myself. And that sounds kind of like just sort of empty talk, but this is what the science says too, that, that, that it's not really your muscles holding you back when you're going for a 20 hour race or something like that. Of course, how tired your muscles are affects how your. This is what we were saying before. It affects how your brain is feeling. If if your if your muscles. So let's say you mentioned fueling. If you if you haven't been taking in enough food to fuel your uh, to fuel your your long race, then your brain is going to have to work harder to push your muscles. So it's not necessarily that your muscles fail, but it means that it it, it makes the mental fatigue worse because you're having to work harder because your muscles aren't working as well as they should because they haven't gotten the fuel they need or they haven't got the hydration that they need. So it's like, in, in a sense, it, it's all like a big circle. Like if, you, if your muscles aren't working, then your brain's more tired. And if your brain's more tired, then your muscles aren't going to work as well. It's all one system. The, the brain and the body are all functioning together. If you, if you mess up one part of that system, all the others are going to get messed up too. Man, this is so interesting. You know, um, with, when, when we're talking about muscles and their ability to perform, like you said, there's so many different pieces. And I just want to point this out for folks, and I'll put this in the show notes. Way back in the day, I did a, uh, really a master class on high intensity interval training. We talked about the different types of muscle fibers. You know, we've got the fast twitch, slow twitch. We've got these intermediate muscle fibers and just being able to pay attention to developing all of them in a, in a sense, you know, and like a lot, there's a lot of endurance athletes now who are incorporating sprints, like doing sprint drills into their uh, workouts because of the development of these different muscle fibers and the different motor units and all that cool stuff. So I'll put that in the show notes, but also in the book, Alex dives in deeper in talking about how muscles play into this whole equation of endurance. So make sure again to check out the book. This is probably the last thing I want to ask you about. There's so many things, but I want to talk about hydration. You know, this is something I mentioned earlier, you know, you can go weeks without food, days without water, and only minutes without oxygen, but water matters a lot, and especially in env certain environments. And you kicked off that chapter talking about is a story of Pablo uh, Valencia. And man, what a story. Can you share that story? And then we'll kind of dive in and talk about hydration. Yeah, this was back in the, in the I think it was the early 1900s in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, and, uh, a couple of prospectors were out looking for a hidden gold mine. And one of them, a guy, a guy named Pablo Valencia, uh, he had, he thought he had found a, 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 a rich gold deposit and he wanted to go stake a claim. And, but they quickly realized they didn't have enough water. So 
uh, Pablo sent his buddy back with the with the horses to get more water while he continued on to the claim. And they were supposed to meet meet back again like six hours later or something. But they they missed each other. They couldn't find uh, where they were supposed to where they were supposed to meet. And eventually the friend was like, oh, well, I can't find him. I don't want to die. So he, he left and left Pablo Valencia for dead. And basically, to cut a long story short, seven days later, Valencia comes crawling into the the uh, the, the camp of uh, a, a, another prospector or of a guy who was out camping in the desert. And, you know, the, one of the reasons I put this in the book, I used this particular example, is the description that of the, the guy who found Valencia of what he looked like after seven days in the desert without water. Now, he had eaten a few bugs and things like he'd been, he'd been drinking his own urine, that's for sure, until he stopped. But it is absolutely gruesome of like that you know his 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 lips just pulled right back and his gums basically disappeared and his eyes open. and you know he's been crawling across the desert through like cactuses and stuff so he's got all these cuts all over his legs but none of them are bleeding they're just like because he's got no fluid in his mm. body but he survived and it you know so this is <laughs> this is one of those tales it's, it's really hard to 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 figure out like you ask, you know, the question I was asking in a sense, just to start out was like, well, like, I wonder what the longest anyone has survived without water is. And like you said, it depends on the conditions. Seven days in the desert is pretty crazy. There's a story from Austria in the late seventies where some small town cops forgot a guy in the, in a, in a prison cell in the basement of a, uh, of a sort of medieval castle. And, and they, they left him there for like 18 days. Uh, he survived, um, the only, re their hypothesis, they don't really know, but their hypothesis is that the, the basement room was so gross and drafty and or, or, or moldy and mildewy that there was condensation on the walls that he was able to lick condensation off the walls. Cause otherwise there's, he should have been dead for sure after 18 days. Um, so anyway, like whatever the records are, it's, it's <laughs> and those are amazing stories, but the, you know, the, those are the stories we hear about, but we, you know, we don't tell the stories of the, uh, you know, 9,999 other, other people in similar situ situations who just die. Cause that's right, the usual thing. That right. If you don't, if you don't get water when you need water, it's like, it's, it's not quite as urgent as oxygen, but if you don't get water, you're going to die. And then the, you know, just as interestingly is, or, or even more trickier is the question of like, okay, short of death, like I'm, I'm not at much risk of dying of lack of hydration here, but at what point does being slightly short of water start to cut into my performance? And that, you know, that's something we've all heard a lot about in the last mm -hmm. few decades. And, and it turns out to be pretty controversial. Yeah. You know, I even, uh, when I was in school, but this was in, in high school, I had some people who were from the lineage. I guess they were like some, uh, leftover folks from the camp of like, don't consume, uh, any water or hydration while you're competing. Right. And so again, it's pretty controversial. And th there are people who set records not, not even that long ago by not consuming. Uh, was it the Boston Marathon? I think you, t you mentioned. Yeah. The but Boston didn't even allow water until I think the late seventies. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was forbidden. <laughs> Bananas. But all that changed, uh, really around that time period. And there was the birthing of, because it's not just water, it's also, uh, electrolytes, right? So there was the birthing of the Gatorade as well. So, Oh, by the way, I want to backtrack really quickly because you mentioned uh, in the story with Pablo Valencia that he also didn't get a heat stroke. Yeah, that's and that's that's an interesting one that is it remains controversial that w when whenever you hear it's like, oh, it's going to be 110 degrees out there tomorrow. Like, make sure you drink lots of water to avoid heat stroke. Well, look, it is important to drink lots of water, but actually the link between dehydration and heat stroke is, is really, uh, weaker than, than, uh, you know, maybe Gatorade w w would like us to think, uh, you get heat stroke cause you overheat, you get dehydrated because you don't have enough fluid, but getting dehydrated isn't necessarily what, what tends to lead to heat stroke. Heat stroke is you've overexerted yourself in the heat and you can get heat stroke. Uh, in fact, it's more likely to get heat stroke if you're running a 10 K where you're unlikely to get really dehydrated than if you're running a marathon when you are going to be dehydrated. Cause in the 10 K you're running faster and harder. So you're pushing, it's like you're running your engine hotter. You're, mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of thing that, that tends to lead to heat stroke. Uh, so all these things are kind of linked together and for sure, like, again, going back to not, you know, flipping from one extreme to the other, it's not, it's not that hydration isn't important, but, uh, it's important to understand that being hydrated doesn't, doesn't necessarily make you immune to heat stroke. Heat stroke is from getting hot. Right. And also not immune to other issues. You mentioned a story of uh, someone who actually died uh, doing doing a long distance run from drinking too much 
right? But it's too much water. And this is where I want to talk about the line between, by the way, that's called hyponatremia, by the way. So hyponatremia. Um, let's talk about the, that line between smart hydration and hyponatremia. There are lots of people who would say, who, who like to blame everything on Gatorade. Um, that mm -hmm. once Gatorade realized you could make, you could make a lot of money by convincing people they need to drink all the time. Uh, all of a sudden hydration gui guidelines changed from you should never drink to you should always drink. You should never, ever let any you know, have any sweat loss without replacing it. And so in the nineties, that's kind of the, the place where, where, uh, sports nutrition guidelines ended up, which was like trying to replace all your sweat losses, you know, whether intentional or not, the message that a lot of people took away from that is, you know, you can never drink enough. And it's always, you should, if you're out there running, you should be just drinking at every, every water stop and so on. And, and that led to people drinking so much that they basically diluted their blood and, and that can be occasionally fatal. Um, so then, you know, how do you how do you draw the the line between? It's obviously bad to be dehydrated. It's obviously bad to be overhydrated, even though that's that's rare. What's the best way to figure out what the right level of hydration is? Well, one pretty good uh, kind of heuristic that humans have been using for a few you know billion years is or million years rather is drink when you're thirsty. Mm, um, interesting. <laughs> it's not, it's not perfect. It's not drink when you're thirsty is not perfect. Like our thirst, if you just drink when you're thirsty and you run a marathon, you're going to be dehydrated when you, when you finish. Right. The question is, is it a serious level of dehydration? And the other question is, is, are you, we've kind of, in a lot of ways, I feel like we've lost the ability to pay attention to our bodily signals. So a lot, if you tell some, in a lot of cases, you tell someone drink when you're thirsty, they might not even notice when they're thirsty. They may not be aware that that's kind of low level feeling of, uh, I don't feel great is a signal that they're thirsty. They might interpret that as, as I'm hungry or, or I'm tired or something like that. Mm -hmm. So saying drink when you're thirsty doesn't, isn't necessarily super helpful to a lot of people, but I think that's a good starting place. Yes, absolutely. To start listening to it. Now, if you're out running a marathon and it's 90 degrees out, you, sh you should be proactive yeah. about your heat. You should make sure you start hydrated and you should probably drink before you let, you're like, man, I'm parched. But you shouldn't be feel compelled to just be, keep downing bottles of water every time. Like if you're not thirsty anymore, you're probably okay. If you're not on a like, you know, five day march in, in the Mojave desert, right. like there's, there's, there's times when dehydration is more serious than others. But I, I, I guess the one, you know, one thing I would really say is under sort of quote unquote normal circumstances, let's say you're going out for a 45 minute or a one hour run from your house through a populated area. It's no big deal if you get dehydrated a little bit, like, no, dehydration doesn't kill you as long as you rehydrate when you get back. So I, you know, I, I never carry a bottle when I run, if I'm just running for an hour or even 90 minutes or, or whatever. And, and, and I'm not, you know, I live in Toronto, I don't live in the Mojave desert. So of course that's specific to my circumstances, but, um, you know, so I would say thirst is pretty good and, and don't, don't sweat it. If you're, uh, you know, pun intended, don't, don't sweat, sweat it. it. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're a little bit dehydrated when you get back. But, but be smart if you're in extreme circumstances, for sure. I love it. Great advice. And so I love that you mentioned how other factors can be, be in play here, you know, hunger and even sleep, because this is all controlled. The hypothalamus is kind of this master gland in our brain. On top of uh, regulating your thirst, your hunger, uh, your body's just experience of being tired, and those signals can be a little bit confusing, you know. So a lot of times when folks are generally just kind of dehydrated, they might feel like a hunger pang of some sort and they feel like I got to eat, which makes you more de dehydrated, you know? So just keep that in mind, keep it in context. Stress is going to influence how your hypothalamus is acting, but that's such great advice is, you know, drink when you're thirsty, but also be proactive. You know, the times when you probably need to get into more hydration just to be careful, but we don't need to overdo it. That's just silly pants. And so I want to ask you also in this context with the, with drinking, you talk about and this is just nuts here, drinking a sports drink, swishing it, spitting it out, and how that can improve your performance. What? Let's talk about that. Yeah, this is amazing. I, I, I love this, uh, this, uh, this kind of example. This, these are some studies that started, that came out, started coming out about 10, 10, 12 years ago, showing that, yeah, you, you can take a sports drink, you can take a mouthful of it, swish it around, spit it out, and it will enhance your performance. And in theory, this is nuts because the whole point of a sports drink is that you're sending fuel to your muscles. You're sending some sugars, you know, some carbohydrate to your muscles, which are going to use it as fuel. If you spit it out, the fuel is not getting anywhere. So what's happening? Well, basically, you're telling your brain that fuel is on the way. 
Uh, and so your brain, so going back to this idea of a central governor, your brain is holding you back a little bit. Your brain is being cautious. Your brain is thinking, uh, we're, we're not out of fuel yet, but we're burning it up pretty quickly. I don't know how long we're going to keep going. We better kind of throttle things back to make sure we don't run out of fuel. And then you send it the signal that more fuel is on the way. It detects fuel in the mouth and uh, it says, okay, all right, more fuel's on the way. So it allows you. So this is kind of a, to me, it's a really clear demonstration that your brain is holding you back. But it's also a really subtle calculation because first of all, I should say, this isn't just a placebo effect where you think fuel is on the way because it doesn't work if you use an artificially sweetened drink. Mm. And it does work if you use if, if you use a tasteless carbohydrate called maltodextrin. So your brain is somehow sensing the energy content, not just the taste that's in your mouth. The other thing that's that's cool to me is, is uh, it doesn't work. Like, let's say you get up in the morning and you go for a one hour run, then it, this switch, rinsing, rinsing and spitting will, will enhance your performance. But let's say you get up in the morning, eat a bowl of oatmeal and then go for a one hour run. It won't work because then you're not low on carbohydrates anymore. So this this the, your, your br this trick that is tricking your brain into thinking more fuel is on the way. It's only relevant if your brain is aware that you're low on fuel. So there's there's these subtle calculations going on in your brain of not only like how much fuel you have, but how quickly you're burning it, how much more is on the way, how long you're going to keep going. So so this is I think a cool demonstration of the brain's role. It's also one of the uh, something that has practical applications. So you'll see these days a lot of like marathoners, cyclists, triathletes, they get towards the end of a race. If you've been out there for four hours taking your, you know, watermelon gels or whatever, you, you're pretty sick of it by the end. And you may be having stomach problems from trying to eat or, or drink and run. And so you may think, I don't want to take any more fuel. Well, you get to half an hour to go. You can say, OK, I, I'm just going to rinse and spit. I'm. I can trick my body for a little bit. I'll get some of the benefits even and without risking stomach upset. You can't do that right from the start of a race. You can't you can't trick yourself indefinitely because at a certain point you are going to run out of fuel. Yeah. But towards the end of a race, you can you can trick yourself a bit. Wow. So many cool, interesting uh, insights in the book and fun facts. Uh, final thing I want to talk to you about is just let's let's get some like takeaway bullet points of how we can uh, increase our endurance, right? Besides putting the hours in, like that, let's not forget about that part of like actually putting in the hours, putting in the work to develop yourself, develop your VO2 max, develop your muscles. Well, what are some of the insights we could take away uh, from today and even in the book, but then, by the way, again, there's so many uh, with being able to boost our endurance. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I'll echo, echo your point that, uh, you know, number one is get out there and do the work. Like that's that's always the 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 biggest bang for your buck. Yeah, you you, you can't fake it. Um, but in terms of some of the ways of expanding beyond those limits that 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 you've got. So first of all, we talked a little bit about mental fatigue, and I think it's it's really important if you and, and again this is if you've got a a physical test like a competition, a race coming up, or if you've got a a, a work thing, if you've got a a, a test, if you've got a presentation. Um, to, to, to incorporate a mental taper into that preparation, to, to make sure that your mind is as fresh as your body when you step to the start line. I think that's really important. Mm. The number one piece of advice that I took away from the book, and that, you know, if I had a time machine to go back and tell my 20-year-old self when I was competing uh, as a track athlete, the number one thing I would tell myself is to pay attention to the inner monologue that is in your head when you're under stress. Are you telling yourself, uh, I, you know, I, I can't do this. This is too hard. I'm going to have to stop. Uh, and if you are, that's going to, that's going to have effects on how your brain is interpreting the signals from the rest of your body. Like w what matters is not, you, you don't fail because your muscles can't go any farther. You fail because your brain inter interprets those signals from your muscles and your heart as, as, you know, being in a danger zone. And your brain's interpretation is affected by the thoughts in your head. By if you're telling yourself that you can't do it, then you're more likely to interpret those signals from your your muscles and your your heart as like, oh, we've we've reached a point we we should stop. So we all have internal monologues, but we don't necessarily think about them. And so the first thing is to become aware of it. Uh, think what do you tell yourself in stressful situations? And if that's not helpful, if you're telling yourself you, I can't do this, then uh, you know try and come up with alternatives and it, it's not an easy process to, th to figure out you have to you have to think carefully about what could I tell myself that will that will make me feel better and more 
confident and enthusiastic, like keep pushing, you're ready for this, you've done the training. Then you got to try those things out uh, in, in, you know, in training, in competition, figure out which ones work for you and make and, and keep working on them until they become second nature. So that next time you have an important, you know, competition or task or, or, or whatever, it's second nature that you're telling yourself, uh, yeah, I can do this. This is, this is good. Keep pushing. And you're going to alter the relationship between what your body's doing and how your mind perceives it. And I should say like the, the last thing I should say is I'm a skeptical guy. We had sports psychologists working with us when I was in in college 20 years ago and and we just thought it was garbage. We didn't really pay attention to it. Like it just seemed like a bunch of hooey. All we cared about was VO2 max and stuff like that. I've come back to this as a different guy because I've gone through and looked at the research and I realized in the last few years, there's people who are studying things like, so what I've just been describing is is called motivational self-talk. You you alter your your self-talk and people have done the studies and they've measured it and they've shown, yeah, you, you give people motivational self-talk, they can push their bodies into a deeper place, but their perceived effort stays the same. So they're, they, they're, they're basically, by changing the words in their head, they're changing the relationship between what their body's doing and how their mind perceives it. And so to me, that's a super powerful lesson that is definitely not just about sports, but is about, about all the endeavors we, we, we face in life, that, that uh, you, you can take control of that monologue. Awesome. Alex, Again, I, I think you did a fantastic job in putting all this information together and packaging it up for folks. And I'm just super pumped for you and all the acclaim that the book is getting. And I know it's just get, just getting started, actually, because it's going to reach a lot more people, even through the show today. And uh, guys, make sure to go out, get yourself a copy of Endure Like ASAP. Alex, can you let people know where they can find the book and where they can connect with you online? Yeah, for sure. So the book is available at your local bookstores and uh, also at Amazon and, and uh, you know, other bookstores. Um, to connect with me, simplest place is probably Twitter. Uh, I, my handle is Sweat Science. Uh, and every, anytime I write a new article, which is a couple times a week, I'll post it there. And if I come across other interest, interesting stuff, that's where I post it. Um, I do have a website, alexhutchinson.net where there's, you know, more background details and stuff like that. But Twitter's probably the place to go and uh, as is your local bookstore. Perfect. Alex, one final question I'm going to throw in here. What is the model that you're here to set for other people with the way that you live your life personally? Uh, that's an interesting question. And I, I, one thing I will say, the first thing I'll say is that uh, m- the model I'm setting, I'm hoping to set is about a process, not about a result. And so all this stuff I'm talking about is, is about changing the internal monologue and things like that. Believe me, I've still got lots of negative thoughts. So I'm, I'm not speaking from the top of the mountain. So it's uh, the, the model I, I, I'd like to, to think about is not about who you are, but about who you're trying to be and how you're trying to get there. Uh, and, and it's one of, of refusing to or, or, or not being held back by your mind and, and just setting goals. And in a more general sense, independent of the book, uh, setting long term goals and, and being patient about getting there. Uh, and and uh, not not worrying about where I am tomorrow, but thinking about where I want to be in five years. Alex Hutchinson, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show today. I hope you got a lot of value out of this. Listen, he just ended on something incredibly powerful, which is mining the process and not the result, because we're all in process. We're all in a process of becoming. There's always another level, whether it's physically, mentally, in your relationships, whatever the context might be. It's really about the process, you know, because we often find once we get to that result, once we get to that destination, the goal, that the, the, the bar keeps moving, right? It's a moving target. We never really arrive. So enjoying the process and really embracing that and understanding it's not about perfection, right? You hear this, all I've said it many times, it's not about perfection, it's about progress. And each day, just making it a mandate to even get 1% better right? Maybe it's in your physical fitness. Maybe it's in your, your mental fortitude. You know, he talked about some putting people through these tests that kind of tire out their mind. And by the way, I want to just point out one of the tips he gave was trying to keep yourself mentally fresh on the day that you're competing or that you're really give, looking to give your best, right? I think that's really important. And also, listen, it's not just in the, the experience of the discomfort, but it's also how you perceive it. And I don't think that this can be stressed enough. I think this is one of the most important pieces to take away from this show. We're all going to go through discomfort, whether it's in 
training, whether it's in our life and, and, and mental and emotional experiences, we're all going to experience it. But the more that we can train ourselves to label it differently or perceive it differently, right? When we're thinking about, for example, somebody asked me uh, when I spoke at an event recently, you know, they sit next to me. This is after I came off stage and they were just like, man, that was amazing. How do you do that? Like, you didn't seem like you were nervous because they were sitting next to me before I went up on stage too. And they were just like, I don't think I could do that. I'm, I would, aren't you anxious? Like, aren't you nervous? And I was like, you know what? I really thought about it. I was like, yeah, there's some feeling there, but I label it differently. It's excitement, right? I feel this excitement. I just want to give. I want to perform. I want to share value, right? It's very different from I'm nervous. I'm so nervous, right? There's a different texture and your brain is already linked up with this, this dialogue, right? And so really paying attention to that and how we're perceiving information coming in, how we're labeling things and really taking back control of our mind because that's where the real battleground is going on, you know, for, for the most part, muscles matter too, as Alex has talked about. So take all of this into context, use this stuff to create the life that you truly deserve because listen, guys, this is just scratching the surface of what we have coming up for you. So we got some incredible guests coming up, mind blowing show topics, but make sure to get yourself a copy of Endure because I just think it's an important part of our library and understanding human persistence, right? Understanding our ability to endure, to keep going to the next level. All right. I appreciate you immensely. If you got a lot of value out of this, make sure to share it out with your friends on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff. You could tag me and of course tag Alex as well. And I appreciate you immensely. Take care, have an amazing day, and I'll talk with you soon.